We're back for your ears only. I'm David Alpern. I'm Melissa Axelberth with a quote from the news. I don't like your politics. That, according to an FBI affidavit, was what a 28-year-old Virginia supporter of gay and lesbian causes told the guard blocking his entry to the Washington headquarters of the Conservative Family Research Council before shooting him in the arm. Besides a 9mm pistol and extra ammunition, Floyd Lee Conkins also had 15 sandwiches from Chick-fil-A whose president is publicly opposed to gay marriage. The FRC blamed liberal groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center for listing it as a hate group. Now this. Everything just folds down the line. If you don't have the crop, which 80 percent of our income comes from grain, then you don't have enough grain to sell your feeders, so our feed position and our feed you know, numbers drop. And like in our business, when you don't have the crops to sell, then the producers are hesitant to buy fertilizer and chemicals, and it just folds right on down the line. That was Tim Pepper of Cooperative Supply Company in Dodge, Nebraska, explaining why the future of corn and other crops is so important. It's a future that looks distinctly dismal now as climate change affects not only corn, but everything that relies on corn. And although there were reports last week that the worst U.S. drought in decades may be leveling off, that's of little comfort to farmers and ranchers who've begun tallying this year's losses and anticipating what may happen in years to come. Recent research finds global warming is likely to get worse over the next three decades. What is now considered extreme heat will become the new norm in at least parts of the U.S. And studies project that unless farmers can develop a more heat-tolerant variety of corn, they'll have to move their crops and farms northwards towards Canada. To talk more about the ramifications of climate change on corn and other key crops and what, if anything, can be done about it for your ears only, we're joined now by Professor Noah Diefenbaugh of Stanford University's School of Earth Sciences. He's also a fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment and prominent in the Hangouts on Air channel for interactive exchanges on YouTube. Welcome to the program. Thanks a lot for having me. First, let's talk terminology, global warming and climate change. What's the difference between the two? Well, global warming is an observation. Um, We've measured temperature stations around the world and uh, also from satellite measurements and and weather balloons that the surface air temperature uh, averaged over the globe has been increasing. So uh, hence, global warming. So I'm perfectly comfortable with with that term. It's it's an observation that that is very robust. Uh, Climate change refers to uh, the myriad of of changes in the climate system, um, uh, many of which have already been uh, observed to, to, to be robustly emerging as a result of global warming, and, and many others which have been projected uh, to occur if, if global warming continues. How quickly are temperatures likely to rise and by how much? Part of that is going to depend on the emissions of greenhouse gases. And uh, we understand the energy of the energy balance of, of planet Earth quite well, and, and the global mean temperature, the global warming, is a, is a response to the, the, in part to the changes in, in greenhouse gas concentrations. So one of the key uncertainties is what will the pace of, of greenhouse gas emissions be? And in fact, uh, over the last decade or so, they've actually been higher than, than what was projected at the end of the, the 20th century. That being said, uh, we're looking at, at probably a degree Celsius of warming over the next three decades when we look across a, a suite of, of assumptions about emissions and, and the sensitivity of global mean temperature to those emissions. Uh, and to give you a sense of perspective on that, the scale of that degree Celsius, we've seen about 0.8 degrees Celsius of warming observed uh, since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Now, as that happens and temperatures rise, what will it do to corn crop yields and prices? Well, this is a really uh, interesting question because if we look over the area of the United States where most of our corn is grown, and and the U.S. is, is the largest producer of corn, largest exporter of corn, and for that one degree uh, Celsius of global warming that we expect over the next three decades, uh, we see uh, two to three degrees of warming of the mean summer temperature, and along with that uh, two to three degrees uh, kind of mean summer warming, we see a shift towards uh, extreme temperatures where about half of the summers that occur are uh, hotter than than the hottest summer of the second half of the 20th century. So from that global warming, that's only about a degree, we see a shift where, where there's a, uh, really a five-fold increase in the uh, occurrence of, of extreme hot seasons. And then if we look during the growing season for corn, we find that 
the severe heat that causes negative corn yields uh, becomes much more frequent. And by coincidence, it turns out that's exactly what's happening uh, in the Corn Belt this summer. And now we're starting to see that uh, move through uh, the corn markets to affect corn prices and and, uh, even the policy discussion about uh, whether or not uh, corn should be mandated to move into the ethanol market, for example. You've talked about crops like corn having to move to cooler climes, but what about the possibility that genetic manipulation could produce more heat-resistant and heat-friendly strains? Well, so in in our research, um, we've looked at that explicitly uh, in a couple of ways. So there's, based on based on research by others, uh, we know that uh, heat accumulation, so warming during the growing season, has a very positive effect on corn, but only up to a point. And uh, above about 29 degrees Celsius, then there's a very steep decline in yield. So we've asked for the, the next 30 years or so of, of global warming, how much increase in heat tolerance would be needed to offset uh, the the change in in corn yield volatility uh, that we expect with that climate change. Uh, so we find that that another couple degrees Celsius of heat tolerance would be required to offset uh, that climate change. Uh, we've also asked uh, how far in space uh, does the climate of the corn belt move over the next thirty years with this with this global warming. Uh, so we're not arguing that, Farmers won't be able to respond. Certainly, there are breeders who are who are working hard to increase heat tolerance, and we've provided a quantitative target for that. And we're also not arguing that farmers will have to get up and move to Canada. Uh, what we're what we're arguing is that, given the climate that currently exists in the Corn Belt, is likely uh, to exist uh, closer to the Canadian border uh, within the next three decades if, if global warming continues. Professor Noah Diffenbaugh, Stanford University School of Earth Sciences and Woods Institute for the Environment, prominent in the Hangouts on Air space online. Quote from the news, cleverly infiltrated in the ranks of the enemy. That was Taliban Supreme Leader Mullah Mohammed Omar on Afghan army and police trainees who have turned their guns on U.S. and NATO trainers. After two more such green on blue incidents last week, the U.S. command ordered all personnel to carry their weapons loaded at all times. Next, at the risk of seeming redundant, comedy and current events. For your ears only. 